Great. Well, thank you, Liz. Round of applause for, for Liz. I'd like to ask Tom Goolsby to come on up and, and join us. Tom grew up in Georgia in LJ, up in the mountains, in a small town, my hometown. Uh, he, he then uh, went on to the Citadel for college, became regimental commander at the Citadel, went on to serve in the United States Marine Corps, uh, was part of the first Gulf War. Uh, he then moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, where he has been with his family for the last 20 years. Uh, he's in private practice as an attorney. Uh, got a crazy idea uh, just a few years ago to run for the North Carolina State Senate. Won the election and has gotten a lot of, uh, been a leader in, in getting past a lot of great legislation in, in criminal justice and many other areas, including being a part of this great effort in North Carolina to get substantial tax reform passed. So, Tom, welcome. Thank you, Kelly. Good to be with you. All right, so we're talking about, you know, it was, North Carolina was great for Georgia because on all these maps, we can look at North Carolina and say, oh, you yeah, know, we're not worse. North Carolina, seven and three quarters percent income tax, uh, a lot of other things. And when the, you started this whole effort at tax reform, if we had a vote of the experts, how many people thought you'd be successful? Not many people would have said so. It was very bold. And, you know, it, tax reform's hard at the state level because we've got to balance our budgets, right? And so just walk us through what was the, the impetus for doing it, the political side of it, and how did, it, how did you get it through? Well, we had a senator from Charlotte named Bob Rucho, who I, I credit with. We, we ended up calling it Ruchonomics. Uh, <laughs> he continued to lead the fight. He was one of the chairs of finance. Had been in the Senate previously, had taken a few years off, and had come back, I think, a session before me. And he was the one who was given the charge to do this. We had strong leadership. Yep tax reform in our House and Senate. And that is probably the key, Kelly, is you've got leaders that are willing to take the hits and take the fight to the enemy. Because the first thing you'll have is you will hear you're taking taxes off the rich. <clears throat> you're, you're reducing, you know, you, you're literally, you're screwing the poor somehow by literally reducing taxes on the, on the only people who pay. And anybody who pays taxes are automatically rich. So what, you current, so what you get immediately in the press is what you're doing to, to, to basically cause problems for the least able to pay in your society, which aren't, aren't paying to begin with. You have that. Then like you were talking about when we were dealing with uh, the, the, the exemptions, all the other things that, that, we, that we ran into, we continued to see you know, feedback, uh, the, the income tax on food. We originally, our original plan was to increase the income tax on food. And of course, the first thing that I said, I, I remember saying this in one of our caucus meetings was, all you're going to hear is that you're literally taxing poor people on the food they need to eat. And this is just not going to fly. So we had a lot, I mean, it went back and forth. We had an original plan. Our uh, Bob Rucho, who was the, the chair of finance I spoke about earlier, ended up at one point because his plan didn't fly. He resigned uh, from the finance chair, he later came back. But I mean, so we had our own inner party stuff that was going on. And th some things worked, some things didn't. What ended up working, of course, was we ended up with a package that was wonderful. It took us from 44th worst in the country to 17th best. We took the personal income rate down from 7.75 to 5.75. Corporate income tax from 6.9 to 5 to 5, and then it's supposed to go to 3% in 2017 if we hit our budget goals. The only thing that I, I think you really, that nobody ever talked about in all of this, is you really have to control your spending to make all this work. That's extremely important. You, you've got to make sure that your spending goes down. Even with the cuts that we made when we first took over, uh, when I first went to the General Assembly, just so you know the dire state North Carolina was in, and this is sort of back late of what we did that makes it even a little more incredible. I showed up in the General Assembly on the first day. We'd had a disaster of a, of a governor that was elected. I showed up mid-term of her term. Her name was Beverly Purdue. She didn't even run again. She had already robbed all of our trust in North Carolina. We had a $3 billion debt that we inherited. We Republicans when we came in. We also had, besides the, you give me another microphone, thank you. We had a, uh, sorry, we had a $3 billion debt that we inherited. 
We owe the federal government $2.4 billion in uh, monies from the unemployment, the, the unemployment tax that they, or unemployment payouts that they had made. Uh, we had our state health care plan was broke, our state retirement plan was broke. I mean, you, you name it, it was, it was in a mess. So with that overlay, we still were able to come back in the following session and, and were able to get past all of this incredible tax reform. We were able to get in there, cut spending. I mean, we, we had incredible, I was a budget chair the whole time in justice and public safety. I'm a lawyer by trade, so I'm in the courts every day. And I knew the waste, fraud, and abuse in the criminal justice system, so it wasn't hard for me to make substantial cuts there. And we did. And you just have to be willing to, you know, to, to make hard choices. I don't know what y'all's budget has been like. I don't know what your leadership's like. But I'm telling you, the, the bottom line, Kelly, is you've got to have strong leadership who is committed, come hell or high water, to making this work. Because the backlash from everyone, even my fellow lawyers, you're going to run us bankrupt if you tax our services. And I'm like, but don't you understand your personal income tax is going down 25%. You know, I mean, does that not make it? No, no, no. It, it's, and, and again, so all the constituencies, all the special interests that are affected uh, start screaming and acting like you are literally throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And what you're doing is improving the climate for everybody so that, you know, the, the tide comes in and all the boats are floated higher. And we've seen in my own district, from the time I took over till the time I left, which was just last month, we went from a 10.6% unemployment rate to a 5.8% unemployment rate. And it's just been incredible what, what has happened by getting a hold on this. North Carolina under the Democrats were rated over and over and over again as a tax hell, as you saw on some of those charts that you showed us. And we have literally, if Georgia wants to do the same, Got to have committed leadership. You got to be ready for a fight because every bad thing you can imagine, every wrong spin, you're going to see uh, yourself hit with. Part of the problem is I think we don't talk about it much. We go into meetings like this and we say, you know, it's a great applause line. Let's eliminate the income tax. But we don't have the tough discussions on how are we going to replace that revenue. And so talk about, let's start with the income tax first. What did you do to broaden the base of the income tax? in North Carolina? Well, as, as you were talking about earlier, and I, I was looking at one of the articles that I had, had worked on, we basically, the, the plan eliminated the personal income exemption but increased the standard deduction. That was one of the things we talked about that was important. Standard deduction uh, was 15000 for married taxpayers filing jointly 12000 head of households and then 7500 for single taxpayers and married taxpayers. Like you said, you don't have the marriage penalty there. Uh, and we had unlimited deductions for charitable contributions. However, we did, with the mortgage interest and property tax deductions, we capped those at $20,000. Uh, we did expand a little bit our service taxes. We were originally going to tax lawyers, fees, architects, doctors, and all that. And you can just imagine the screaming and the, uh, and just the, the oh yeah, it, it, it just never, ended. we backed off that. But at some point, I mean, it, we are a service-based economy. I mean, if we're going to be smart about it, the food tax is a tough one. If you're going to, we, we lowered our food tax many years ago uh, down to 2%, and we were looking at increasing it. Uh, we have, have left it there at, at 2%. Uh, there's, there, I, do you all tax it at all in Georgia? Kelly? Well, we don't at the state level, but we do at the local level. Oh, so there's a local, a local food. Okay. We also freed up uh, some of the, the revenue off the sales tax. We freed up the local counties to do more with it, uh, to, to allow them to make more choices with sales tax revenues that they got because uh, of just a number of things to keep them happy that we did in the, in the original plan. And can, I, can I add to that real quickly? Sure. I think that politically that's really important to think about. Uh, you can't, can't ignore the local concerns because uh, you'll get a lot, there, we've seen it in a lot of states where um, a, a good example is personal property taxes. Um, they're, they're not a very, or business property taxes is what I meant to say. Um, they're not a good tax and we all agree that they probably should be phased out, but there will tend to be a local revenue source and it's very hard to change those type of things. And so it's really important to talk to local governments about you know, what their concerns are, what their priorities are so that you can uh, take those into account because politically they can be um, very difficult to overcome, and I think that if you ignore them in the beginning, then you're, you're going to be in trouble. You got rid of a lot of carve-outs. I know we, we were looking at the, we have a very generous uh, 
tax credit for electric vehicles. Uh, and we have film tax credits and many other types of credits. You got rid of a lot of those. Yeah, and I create, again, I credit Bob Rucho for that. He realized that substantial tax reform like we were doing is not going to work if you have all of these incentives. The incentive for reducing taxes is reduced taxes. Yep. It's not giving the people with the best lobbyist the, an additional tax uh, reduction. And of course, one thing that we saw with the film tax credits, you guys have been stealing a lot of our film business and we don't appreciate that. <laughs> but you guys are paying heavily for it. You're, you're paying a lot for it. And the studies show that you're giving away a lot of your taxpayers' money uh, over and above what you're getting back. It is a bad economic decision and you will pay for that. Uh, but that's your choice. Let's go back to principles, mm -hmm. I think, because it's so important. Taxes get complicated. The, once the special interests get involved, I think it helps us to stay united to focus on the principles. And what's interesting is if you're a good economist, there's a lot of agreement mm -hmm. on basic tax principles. Yep. You know, broaden the base, yep. lower the rate, don't tax business inputs. Taxing consumption is better than taxing income, savings, and investment. There's a lot of agreement, even mm -hmm. among uh, liberals and conservatives. It surprises a lot of people. Where we get into differences are two things. At the state level, since we can't run a deficit, taxes equal spending. Exactly. You can't spend more money unless you raise taxes. And so those that want to spend more money are going to be for a tax increase. Mm -hmm. um, one thing's interesting, you all put, conservatives are worried, you know, yes, we like to cut spending, but we want to make sure we do it in a responsible way. So Tom, you have revenue ca uh, targets that have to be met before the corporate income tax declines. How, how does that work? Well, yeah, what, and what we're trying to do, of course, as I said, uh, corporate income tax from 6.9 to 5 and on down to 3, if what we're saying is true, that if you lower the tax burden on businesses, you'll have more come, they'll be more productive when they get there, then it will actually raise more capital in order to fund your spending. Because we're not simply in the business, and what we're trying to do is adjust our tax code to make economic sense. and and. And again, my whole thing is too, I do think government spends way too much. I like the fact that if we can, again, make sure that we don't allow, and we've kept our budget growth at even less than inflation. I mean, it's been around 2% the last, the last four years that I've been there, which is, I think, the way things ought to be. In fact, I, I would like to see it even either leave it at its current level and let inflation take care of it and continue to make cuts as you see fit. And I, I the... Next year, the President Pro Tem in the Senate has already warned all the budget chairs that they're going to be spending a great deal of time because we're going to basically, as I understand it, go into almost a zero-based budget. They're going to really start over, drill down, and just start building spending from the bottom up, which is an incredible undertaking. If it can take place this first round, I think they'll just get their feet wet and realize what a, what a hard fight that it'll be. But uh, again, all you can do is adjust things, roll with the punches, uh, you know, hold, hold spending, and make sure that the tax reductions that you've made actually bring in the income that you believe they will. And so far, I mean, we've, we've seen that. Not only has it brought in the income, it's also increased our economy. I mean, we, we're now a much more tax-friendly state. The guys who are out there selling out our Department of Commerce are finding welcome people to come in and start businesses in North Carolina and move them to us. And we're not having to sell the farm in order to bring somebody in with all the economic incentives and everything else. We still have those. And again, I don't agree with a lot of those, but that's, that's life. One last question for each of you, and we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. Liz, um, the other area where you know, liberals and conservatives will, will perhaps disagree is the regressivity. Mm -hmm. So if you're shifting away from an income tax to a sales tax, it is more regressive. Mm -hmm. But as you said, there are things to do. I mean, every, I, I get frustrated when people talk about the fair tax. They talk about it's going to increase taxes on 80% of the people. They forget, they forget conveniently to, to talk factor in the, the prebate, mm -hmm. which is specifically designed so no one under the poverty level has a tax increase. Uh, you can do it in a more targeted way than the prebate with earned income tax credits. So yeah, can you address the regressivity issues in other ways so that that should not be an issue? Yeah, absolutely. So I think first I want to mention, you know, those principles we mentioned, those five things I talked about, 
Um, the fifth one is pro-growth. Uh, we don't want to just divvy up the pie differently. We want to make the pie bigger overall. And I think that the key to that is structuring your tax code in a way that's simple, non is neutral, you know. And um, one of those things is consumption taxes tend to be better than um, income taxes, but you got to get the base right. Uh, if you have a narrow, a narrow sales tax base, um, it's going to be just as volatile, just as um, unstable as as a, a poorly structured income tax. And so you have, to, you have to think about that. But so on that note, as you shift towards more pro-growth types of taxes like sales, retail sales taxes, uh, you, have to, you can't ignore that they tend to be regressive. Uh, lower income people pay a larger share of their income um, in sales taxes than they do in income taxes. And so uh, a lot of times people uh, raise the alarm when you want to shift towards consumption taxes. But you can have a prebate. Uh, you can make a stand. Your st if you want to, if you don't want to get rid of your income tax and you want to flatten it, you can have a really generous standard deduction. Um, you can do things like the earned income tax credit, where um, uh, there's some some considerations of incentives and work incentives built in, which is we like that. Uh, there's a lot you can do. You shouldn't uh, put the halt on sales tax um, just because it's regressive. Um, it's not a, a be all and end all. You can you can fix it and you can make it work. And so I think that. Um, it's important to point out the trade-off. So if you're paying, paying less in income taxes, um, sales tax bill goes up, you might have a bit of a, you might, the offset might make sense there. And so I think um, a, a good example, uh, you need to be able to show people this. A great example is what, what happened in DC this year. Um, I don't know how many people of you heard about the sales tax reform or the, the general reform in DC, but there was this huge spread called, it was the yoga tax. Wanted to expand the sales tax to gyms and fitness clubs, and people freaked out. They absolutely went berserk about it. Uh, there was P P Vita Fitness, you know, stormed the city council and had bright T-shirts and said, "Don't tax wellness." Or you know, the yoga tax. Um, they forgot to mention though that income taxes for everybody. Uh, that that tiny little increase in sales tax is going to be largely offset by lower income taxes. And I think you need to show that. That's very important. You can't just tell people got to show them um, that it's going to be better for them. And uh, if, you, if you fail to do that, then you're going you're gonna to run into trouble because those lobbies can be very, very persuasive. Of course, as someone once said, the best thing you could do, uh, well, the best welfare program is a job. Mm -hmm. And like you look at Kansas, their private sector job growth um, after their tax reform, I think is number two in the country. So that's exciting. What would you do differently? What would you do again if you had to do it again in North Carolina, Tom? Uh, what, what's the, what are the lessons learned? I think you've given us a few. And any, anything to add? Uh, the, the biggest lesson, as Liz was just saying, you know, we, it, like for us, you increase the standard deduction, which means the poor aren't going to be, you know, th there aren't going to be any tax increases on them. But all you're going to hear is you're cutting taxes for the wealthy. That's all you're going to hear. You, you can't go and explain that away to some reporter who you wonder if they can tie their shoes in the morning. It, and they're going to literally turn around, no matter how much time you spend with them, that's going to be the headline. You're going to have a, a moral Monday crowd like we had show up every Monday night at the General Assembly, uh, touting how we were, you know, just putting the screws to everybody who was, was in the poor column. And, of course, the guy who led that fight gets about $300,000 in federal and state monies into his various charities every year. Uh, and perhaps there was a little bit of self-dealing there. But, of course, that never gets reported either. You guys know who are Republicans that it doesn't matter what you do, you're, you're always the bad guys. It amazes me that we continue to win elections, though, over and over again. Somehow, the truth always leaks down to, the, to your constituents, and they realize there's more money in their pocket, and things are better. But I, but I would say, Kelly, you have to be ready for the backlash. You have to have strong leadership. If you don't have strong leadership who's committed to it, you might as well not start. Because all you're going to do is take a lot of arrows for nothing. That's the bottom line.